uh, Barry Eck. Uh, Barry is coming to us from Sayreville, New Jersey. He is the president of the New Jersey Emergency Management Association. He just went through uh, the difficult challenge of cleaning up and is still cleaning up from Hurricane Sandy. He is a former, uh, he's a, a United States Air Force veteran of Vietnam War. He has been a member of the Sayreville Fire Department since 1975. He also is a member of the Sayreville Police Department for the last 28 years. He has also been, and since 2002, he has been the Department's Homeland Security Coordinator. Uh, in 2002, he was appointed the Sayreville Municipal Emergency Management Coordinator and still serves in that capacity. And we're very happy to have Barry here today. So thank you and uh, let's welcome Barry. Good morning. How's everybody doing today? Good. 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 Let's get that going so we get some time there. Uh, as I said, my name is Barry Hick. Um, I'm the Emergency Management Coordinator for Tampa Old Sarah in New Jersey. Some of you may have heard about it. Uh, our town got the most significant direct hit um, of any year-round town in the state. Uh, yeah, the beach towns got hit pretty good. We'll see some of that in a little bit. But uh, for the most part, Sarable, which is uh, based around the river, uh, took a significant hit. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Something that has been going on for a long time. We've been talking about a date with Sandy. Something that, for me, I've been predicted for 40 years. The problem is people don't believe it. People don't buy into it. People never thought that this would happen in our part of the world, or at least in my part. Everybody thought it was going to be a nice, easy storm. It had um, Irene the year before. Not a lot of damage. Uh, it was more of a rain incident than anything else, and it really didn't impact us as bad. But Sandy was different. We're going to talk a little bit about it. We're going to talk why did it happen. Why did the damage happen? Why did the the um, false beliefs happen. Why did the storm happen? Why was it so devastating? What were some of the key issues? Key issues that not only the police and fire dealt with, but you dealt with at DPW. Something that people don't realize is the importance of the Department of Public Works in any community. You guys are truly the root of the community. Right? And I don't say that because I'm sitting here in the conference. I've been involved in this for a long, long time, and I know the issues that are out there. I've got a DPW director pulls his hair out. I've got so, so little hair left. Every time it snows, the guy goes into a panic. But again, he does a good job. Once the storm clears, once the firemen get back on the trucks, go back to the firehouse, once the police officers go back to the donut shops, believe me, that's when you guys go to work. And you guys work around the clock for a long time. Right? I keep my lunches very loose, very comfortable. Um, you have questions? Feel, feel very free to throw them out there because there's a lot of stuff here I think that you're going to want to learn about. And we're going to talk about will it ever happen again. Well, why did it happen? Why did it happen? As we all know, a lot of the storms start out there and went the um, far part of the uh, Atlantic over in here. And what did they do? They worked their way across and they worked their way up towards us. It was the right combination. If you don't believe in climate warming, you're only fooling yourself. I'm going to tell you right now. It is definitely happening, it's definitely occurring as we speak. It's something that we have to be aware of, it's something we have to deal with. The water temperatures were up that summer by at least 40 degrees from the previous summer. That's a significant rise off the Jersey coast, all right? That is very, very significant. Because what does it do? It draws the storms further up the coastline. We had a harvest moon. Nobody gets a storm the end of October. Harvest moon, beautiful, nice, nice time of year. Weather was nice. But that moon was dead with you. Time of the tides. When that storm struck, it was high tide on a harvest moon, which is the worst tide you could possibly have on the Jersey Shore. And the changes in the steering winds of the ocean currents. As the water temperatures are warming up, as things are changing, they're drawing this up, the steering currents are getting, are getting stronger, and we're really starting to see some significant changes out there. Not since 1903 did New Jersey ever get hit like that. 1903, you can see the storm came up from right down in this area here, followed up, made a turn just south of Atlantic City. If this storm had come in 36 miles south, it would have creamed Atlantic City and we would have had thousands of dead people. That's a significant thing. 36 miles. How far is 36 miles? When you look at the East Coast, it's nothing. It's nothing. Okay? And you can see all the storms. All the storms missed us over the years. 
All these storms have missed us, with the exception of that one right there, and then Sandy. Why was it so devastating? All the things coming together, nobody buying into it, nobody believing that it would ever happen. Got the entire East Coast here, it can come ashore in any way. But when you look at the East Coast, look at the significance of it. All right? Everything going up here is kind of a flat surface going up. What do you have right here? You've got a wall. As, as most of you know, hurricanes turn in a counterclockwise motion. As that hurricane was churning up, and it was turning up and pulling up, you see this ridge right here? This is digging up the ocean. It was a thousand mile storm, a thousand miles across. It was a monster. As it came across here, it started pushing up along the shelf, the continental shelf. And as it started to push the water up, it got into this area here. The problem is, from here to here, a few hundred miles, 200 some miles. As this storm is turning counterclockwise, where's all that water going? It's sitting there and pushing in. All the way across, pushing right into that little creek right there, that little part of my world. Nowhere else on the East Coast do we have that kind of problem. 220 miles of ocean from being pushed into a funnel. This is a funnel. This is Long Island, as you see here. This is all New Jersey. That's where I was. This entire area here got inundated. As the water got pushed up, and it started to draw the water up from the ocean, it started to push it into the Raritan Bay. This being the Raritan Bay right here, you've got a seven mile point from here to here, okay? 15 miles or so long. It's a shallow bay. Years ago it was deep, but over the years it's gotten very shallow. As that storm pushed in, it started to push the water from the deeper ocean up and started to ride on top. As it started to ride on top, of course, what they call a storm surge. That storm surge was absolutely devastating. The water had nowhere to go. It was getting pushed right into the funnel. The storm was so big, it was drawing down Long Island Sound, because as I said before, it's over a thousand miles. As it's drawing in, it's also drawing down Long Island Sound, right down into the East River, into the Hudson River, and what normally when the Hudson goes and goes out to the ocean, the East River goes out to the ocean, those two bodies of water were getting fed into this bay. Nowhere for it to go, except my backyard. Long Island Sound, the Hudson River again, it all, it all came in and it just pushed continuously around into the area. What you're looking at here is a little bit closer map. Yeah, the Jersey Shore got hit, but this is the funnel I was talking about. This town here, almost leveled, almost, almost washed away. But in here, this is where the problem came. Right in through here. This is all part of Cerebral. This is all part of Mulbridge in here. You had storm surges coming through here. A housing development right here washed away. About 15 or 20 houses washed away. You'll see some of the pictures in a moment. As it came up into here, up into the East Brunswick section, all the way up into that area there, all heavy damage. Came across, for the way itself, the waterfront in here, where they've got the docks. The waterfront had 12 foot surges there, 12 to 14 foot surges. 12 to 14 foot above the tide. Absolutely devastating. Not even New Orleans has the same problem. At least with New Orleans, yeah, you've got that long mountain and long ridge here, Problem is, you don't have a lot of water pushing out of the Gulf. It's not as big as the Atlantic Ocean. It doesn't have that massive current going through it. 37 miles, 36 miles made the difference. And at any one of these, we could have really had some damage. Even down in this area, I saw the Bay Farm for the city of Cape May. Didn't have any damage hardly at all. Didn't have any damage hardly at all. Because again, as that storm came, it pushed down, and it's going down, pushing Counterclockwise. So, what were the key issues? We're going to talk about the key issues. We're going to talk about what went right. A lot of things went right. But more importantly, we're going to talk about what went wrong. I'm going to tell you about mistakes that I made, mistakes that my staff made, mistakes that a lot of different people made. Why? Because I don't want you to make those same mistakes. I don't want you to have the same problems we had. 
people need to take these storms seriously. And unfortunately, they didn't. How do you protect your community? The area you're looking at right now, right in through here, this whole area, all these houses here, all these houses here, all these houses here, all these houses here, all of the water. All of the water. This is a pond called Major's Pond. I predicted for the last 40 years, that sooner or later, the Atlantic Ocean would meet Major's Pond. And as it came in that river right through there, and came up along the backside here and exploded, it did reach that pond. That pond had water coming in from the Atlantic Ocean. Absolutely incredible. That location right there is approximately four miles from the ocean. Four miles. All up and through here, all these houses, all heavily flooded, heavily damaged. My house is just about three houses beyond that. I was fortunate I didn't have any damage. Could have. Maybe the next time I will. Why is it once said? Plans are nothing. Planning is everything. If you're not planning for disasters like this, you're planning to fail right off the bat. Planning is key. Problem is, too many people are so proprietary they want to do the plans themselves. They want to work within their own little cubbies. You can't. Planning is a team effort. Planning is a team event. You've got to get your key people. Sit down with the table and start planning for it. Start talking about what's happening. If you don't plan for it, believe me, you're going to have issues. You need to start planning at the beginning. Problem is, how do you convince people that don't believe that something's going to happen that you want them to plan for it? People don't believe it's going to happen, they're going to say, nah, don't worry about it, they won't take it very serious. Who should be part of that planning team? Look at your key personnel. Who are they? Even the people at the lowest level, the guys cutting the grass, the guys painting the curves, have got input for you. You need to have team meetings with them. You need to talk to them. You need to listen to them. They've got useful information. Identify your, prior, your priorities. What are the priorities? Obviously, life safety, engine stabilization, property conservation. That's the way we do in the fire service. <coughs> life safety, engine stabilization, property conservation. But once that life safety issue is resolved, you're left with a mess. You're left with everything else afterwards. Everyone needs to have a voice, a unified command. How many people here are trained in unified in, in uh, incident command, ICS? Every hand in this room should be up. You know why? It's the law. It's the law. Under NIMS, under Executive Power, Executive um, Presidential Executive Order 5, 7, and 8, I believe it is. Every individual that can be involved with Planning for preparation of response to recovery from an incident has to have NIMS training, National Incident Management Training. That's the law, okay? A lot of people don't understand that. And you guys are part of it. You guys are a significant part of the response to planning and recovery. So you have to have that training. You have to understand how the system works. You have to understand the importance of what you do. And you have to have a unified command. You know, I, I laugh at people, they, oh, we, don't, we don't need to have other people involved with this, this is just a police issue. Cops are usually the worst, I'm going to tell you right now, cops are worse. And well, one thing I forgot to tell you, I throw rocks, okay? As a cop, I throw rocks at cops. As a fireman, I throw rocks at firemen. EMS, I like throwing rocks, so I just throw rocks at EMS. <laughs> <laughs> just the way it is. I got, I got issues with EMS, we'll talk about that a little later. I got, I got issues, not with EMS in general, but with my squad. Oh, a bunch of knuckleheads, they are. <laughs> but at any rate, cops are the worst for you unified command. Why? Why do you think cops are the worst? Don't be afraid to tell me, because I've already said it. They're just clueless a lot of times. Huh? They're just clueless a lot of times. They're clueless? Why do you think cops are the worst for unified command? Territorial. Very territorial. What do you think? They're reactionary. Police are reactionary, okay? And that's the key. They're territorial, but they're reactionary. Unfortunately, police don't work in a team effort. Police work individually, okay? As a police officer, when I go on, on duty, when I go out on the road, I come in, sit down at the station commander, sit down with the shift sergeant, five or six of us sitting there eating our donuts and drinking our coffee, because that's what cops do, right? 
Mm. I'm a new, I'm copying a new new name. It's cappuccino and bagels. <laughs> right? Cappuccino and bagels. I come in, the sergeant sits at one end of the table, sits down, he looks, he says, well, you're covered here, you're covered there, you're covered this. He throws the keys out there in a big pile, and you better not call again, unless you find a body someplace. All right? Because they are territorial, but they work independently. Fire will work as a team. DPW has to work as a team. There's a reason 343 firefighters and only 29 police officers died in the World Trade Center. That's because firemen work as a team. They go in together as a team, they come out together as a team, they die together as a team. Cops are trained to be independent, to work separately. It's not that one's braver than the other, it's not that one's more skilled than the other. What it comes down to is, when I go out on the road, I'm trained to go out there and do my job by myself without getting involved with other people. I don't rely on other people. And that's why 343 firefighters and only 29 police officers died. All right? But it's a unified team. You have to have that unified community. Any firemen in here? Go ahead, tell me any firemen. Any police officers? Ah, man. <laughs> Get to watch the here. You guys remember, uh, again, I'm talking about the importance of unified command. I'm talking about you being part of that command. You being part of the planning effort. You guys remember the, uh, uh, remember the um, incident down in uh, Philly many years back, I it was in the mid 80s when they burned down a whole block trying to get those people out of the moon building? Remember that? Osage oh. Avenue. What's that? Osage Avenue. Osage Avenue. How many people died there, remember? Eight or ten or something like that? Yeah. yeah. Well, a few years back, I was down in uh, Philly Airport. I was teaching uh, ICS to instant command system to the uh, air marshals, federal air marshals. One of the guys in the room was sitting there talking back and forth, and I brought up about that particular fire. And I says, "Well, you know, this is something that happened here locally. Do you guys think you need a unified command there? You know, a team effort of people talking together." And one guy looks at me and he says, absolutely not, it was a police issue. I said, why do you think it was a police issue? He says, because I was the guy in charge. The guy was a major, a retired major from the state police department. Okay? Very nice man. I looked at him and he says, are you the guy in charge, huh? He says, yeah, and that was strictly a police issue. We didn't need the fire department or anything else like that to get involved in it. That was a police issue. So I said, well, okay, well, let me ask you a question. If you sat down at that table up there with police chiefs, your fire chiefs, your Indian chiefs, and he said to everybody at the table, hey, we're going to drop a smoke grenade in there or a tear gas grenade in there, whatever the case was that they dropped, and that's what's going to chase these people out of that building. Well, if the fire chief was sitting there and looked at you and said, sir, let me explain something to you. Those buildings are close to 100 years old. They're balloon construction. The houses are packed racks. They're all debris inside of them. If that fire, if there's a fire starts in that house, we're not going to be able to go in there and put that fire out. So I looked at him and I says, would you have done something different if the chief told you that? And he looked at me and he says, yeah, yeah I guess I would have. But they didn't bring the fire chief to the table, did they? And what happened? That's the importance of unified command, guys. Bringing the key players to the table, sitting down in a unified voice, and working together, finding out what impacts other people. That's part of planning. If you don't have that key component, you can't plan. As I said before, everybody's got a place. You need to have meetings. When, how often, who has to be there, who speaks, all key components of it. Every incident, before the incident occurs that you know of, when you know a major storm is coming, you need to sit down with your staff and have a meeting before it occurs. Make sure that everybody understands the importance of it. How often? My, for the Hurricane Sandy, we started three days before. We had staff meetings at 9 o'clock and at 2 o'clock every day for almost a month. Twice a day. They were well publicized. Everybody knew about it. Three days before the storm, we sat down and I brought everybody into the room. I said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to have these meetings, and everybody needs to attend them. And that was the police chief, the fire chief, the mayor, the council, all the key players. All the key players have to be there. 
Who speaks? The incident commander speaks, but everybody speaks. Everybody gets input. Everybody gets an opportunity. The incident commander is the guy that's going to run it, and he's going to manage it, as a good manager should. The key is keeping control of those meetings. It's very important that you keep control of those meetings. You have to have strong leadership. It's not a dictatorship, but it's a meeting that has to be controlled. How many people in here? Let me see the fire brigade. Show hands on the fire brigade. Okay, guys. At your fire department meetings, could they be done in half the time? <coughs> Sir? Could they? Your fireman? No? Put the fireman over there. Your fire department, <coughs> could you have them done in half the time? Sure. If it wasn't all the what? Bullshit. All bullshit. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. All bullshit. That's the key, guys. That's the key. You need to control the meetings. As the guy in charge, you have to not allow those sidebars. <coughs> you have to keep the meeting on track. You go around the room and you talk to the people individually. And once they start to go on, like my DPW guy would go on every time we sat down in a meeting, Bernie would cry, I got no power in my DPW cry, I need a new building, the roof leaks, this and that. That's not the place for it. So I cut him off. After a while, he didn't want to come to the meetings anymore. But the bottom line is, it's not, the, it's not, a, it's not a complaint place. We're not sitting here worrying about, we got jobs to do. And it's important that you manage those meetings, because you know what, if you don't, People aren't going to come to you. My meetings, one hour. You know 59 minutes and 59 seconds, you're going out the door. You're not all out, people are going to walk target. I keep them on target, I bring them around. If you can guarantee, if I can guarantee each one of you, the meetings that you're going to are going to be one hour, and you know, would you be more happy to go? Absolutely. Absolutely. So you have to control the meetings. The meetings have to be regular. One voice, but whose voice is it? One of the things in ICS, I've been teaching ICS since the late 70s, early 80s, key word, egos. When you come into the room, you check the egos at the door. I don't care if you're a police chief, I don't care if you're an Indian chief, I don't care who you are. Everybody in that room is equal. All right? So you check the, check the egos at the door. It's gonna hurt you if you don't. Can't allow people to get on soapboxes, as I've said before. No sidebars, no complaining about this, that, and the next thing. Keep it on target. Keep it on target for what you need to do. Everyone needs to understand what the planning process is about, how it works. And if they don't, you take them aside and you explain it to them. Because they are an important part of your team. Tasking your staff. Make, make sure that every one of your people knows what they're responsible for. And again, go right down to that guy that's painting the curves. Everybody needs to know what their tasks are, what their duties are, what their responsibilities are. Everyone needs to know what everyone else is doing. I want to know what you're doing and you're doing and you're doing. Everyone needs to know that so that we're not duplicating those efforts. Provide guidance, but don't micromanage. If you're a manager, let your people do the job they're trained to do. Unfortunately, there are managers out there that micromanage. I don't need that. I need to be able to say, you know your job, and if you know your job, go out and do it. If you have a question, come and see me. If I've got to micromanage your job, why do I have you even doing it? Okay? That's the bottom line, guys. Let your people. See, you, you've got key people. You, some of you may not realize the potential of the people you've got working for you. <coughs> That's important. Knowing your people. Knowing what their capabilities are. Understanding what their capabilities are. Knowing a little bit about them. Maybe something that they do on the side, maybe a hobby or something like that, helps you get your job done because, again, you can assign them to certain tasks. Train them before the event. Specific training. This was a problem that I had. This is a problem that I had. I did not have my POC completely trained in key positions. I didn't have them trained, several of them, in key positions. And more importantly, I didn't have backups. That hurt me significantly. Exercise your positions annually. Have your people go out there and practice them. Go out there and try the system. See if it works for you. You're going to find out that when you start doing these things and you start planning for them, you start having these annual trainings, the positions are going to require certain tools. You're going to know what those tools are in advance so that you can get them. Things as simple as a pad and paper. Pencil and paper. Something as simple as that. Do you give your staff that, the tools that they need to do the job? If the guy's going to be calculating on a lot of numbers, does he have a calculator? 
something as silly as a pencil sharper. All these things, it's the tools they need to do the job. You wouldn't send a guy to dig a hole without a shovel. Then make sure that all your people have all the tools that they need to do their jobs. And do it before the event. Train. Practice and train and practice and train and then practice and train again. Is your EOC ready? How many people know where their emergency operations center is in their town? Every hand should be up. Okay, you need to know where the EOCs are. You need to be inside of them once or twice. Go inside, slip around, be comfortable with them. That's the key hub. That's where the decision making is coming from. Yeah, stuff goes on out in the field, but the key planning comes from the EOC. The support that you're going to need is going to come out of that EOC. So you need to have enough phone lines. You need to have radios away from the main planning room, a side room, someplace where the chatter is not going to interfere with the operations going on in the EOC. A side room, a, a, another part of the building, whatever the case may be. You need to control outside information flow. Information's got to be coming from all angles. Information's got to be continuous. If necessary, you're going to have to send people out there, field observers, to take a, a running look at what's going on. Some people call it a dashboard, a dashboard uh, assessment. But you need to know what's coming out, what's happening out there in the field. That's a very important. Maps, whiteboards, all the stuff that you need to manage the operation. That EOC's got to be equipped with that. And you all need to know where the EOC is and you should be comfortable with it. Security is critical. <laughs> I love this one. EOCs are not a hangout. How many people have worked in an EOC and it's ought to become a hangout? Anybody? What if, what if the people just hang out talking about what they did last week? You know, I, you know, I, I went to the, I went to the party the other night, shot food. I was fabulous, absolute fact. But that's it's not a hangout, guys. It's got to be, and you have to manage it. You have to put security there. I put one of my auxiliary officers at the door. If they're not needed in the room, they don't come in the room. Because you have to control it. You don't need people talking all over top of each other. In Woodbridge, they had a uh, mobile command post. You just call it Porcupine One. They had antennas all over. Tell them. We'd go there for our left field. We went to uh, the Abbott Up Correction Facility for the um, mentally unstable with the fire, and we were there for several hours. And I walked into their mobile command post. What it is a big Winnebago, a monstrous Winnebago. And that's when smoking was back popular, going back probably about 25, 30 years ago. I walked into there, and you could cut the smoke with a knife. It was so thick. I mean, you couldn't even breathe on it. And you had probably, I'd say close to 18, 19 people in that Winnebago. And I, you know how big a Winnebago is. 18, 19 people cramped in, they're sitting there talking about, hey, what'd you do last night? Anything good? And then we sat over at Legends Bar, had a good time, had a few beers. Oh, you had to see the farm, and she was absolutely gorgeous. Oh, yeah. And you're sitting there and you get all of this stuff going back and forth. Meanwhile, this guy's trying to work. He's got things he needs to get done. So, again, you want to keep people from going in there. Keep your EOCs, keep your mobile command posts <coughs> secure. Don't let people hang out. If they don't have a reason to be there, kick them out. And don't be afraid to kick them out. You're a manager. You're supervisors. Manage properly. Manage properly. There's a difference between ICS and command and ESF, emergency support functions. Okay? Field operations need to be managed in an ICS mode. What's going on out in the field? ICS mode. Making sure that everybody understands who reports to what. Breaking it down into divisions and groups. Breaking it down into branches out in the field so that you maintain your span of control, so that you maintain the accountability of your people. Because what did I say the priorities were first? Life safety? That trumps everything. If you don't know where your people are, if you don't know what your people are doing, their life safety is at issue. And you need to understand that, okay? Span of control has got to be maintained. Support functions can come out of your EOC. Support functions being, I need additional fire trucks. The EOC can provide that. I need additional manpower. The EOC can provide that. I need more dump trucks to go to a certain area. The emergency uh, support functions can provide that all out of your EOC. But again, you have to practice it. You have to do tabletops. You have to do functional exercises. You have to do full scale exercises. Exercises that are going to test your system to see if the system is working or not. Key to success, 
Surround yourself with quality people. Absolutely, surround yourself with quality people. As I said before, knowing your people's capabilities, knowing what they can and cannot do, is gonna be critical for you. Don't set yourself up for failure by giving somebody a task that you know they probably can't do. There's a job for everybody out there. There's a position for everybody out there. Knowing the people and knowing what they're capable of doing and what they're capable of not doing is going to be what's critical for you. Because then you're going to be able to assign your people properly. You're going to get the most out of your manpower. Well, let's get back to the storm. It starts with the warnings. People don't buy into warnings, okay? When is it too soon to start warning your people? When is it too soon to tell them to prepare themselves for disaster? And then when is it too late? That's a fine line. Especially when you're doing evacuation. Especially when you're putting things into a get out or die mode. Very, very critical where that line lays. How do you get the word out? How do you get the word out to the public? Reverse 911. That Nixle, you guys got Nixle out here? Nixle program? It's a, it's a computer program that works off of um, on your phones, on your uh, iPhones and iPads and stuff. I, I think it's limited to like 140 uh, words or something like that. It's a real, real good way of getting information out, getting information out to the public. Everybody signs up for it, they get the information. How do you get that word out there? You have CERT teams, <coughs> community emergency response teams, that can go door to door, knocking on the door, put a flyer in there, hey, Big storm coming, better watch TV. Yeah, that's one of the problems. People say, oh, we didn't know it was coming. What are you living under a rock? This storm was predicted for a A week and a half, this storm was predicted out there. And you know what's funny thing? You know who predicted it the best? Anybody uh, follow that? The European model. Yeah, the European model. Uh, Sam Champion, all those local women. Ah, it's going to skirt up, it's going to go out. Yeah, it's going to go out, all right. European model one is the one that had it nailed down, and boy, they, they hit it right on the money. He said, it's going to turn left, hit Barry right in the head. And it hit Barry right in the head. So how do you get the word out? You need to exercise that beforehand. How do you recall your people? Do all your employees know what's coming? Do you have a staff meeting room say, hey guys, look, this is what's coming down the road. We need you to be available. We need you to be ready. What are you going to say? What are you going to tell them? Having that right wording, the right message out there. Not to create panic, but to get their awareness. That's important. Where do you tell them to go? Some of them I'd like to tell where to go, all right. <laughs> but where do you tell them to go? Do you have a shelter? Do you have shelter capabilities? Do you tell them to go inland? Well, I try and tell anybody that's going to be evacuated, the first place you want to go with is family. If you don't have any family, find a friend. If you can't find a family or a friend, come to my shelter. That's a last resort, though. And I'll explain why in a little bit. Who are you going to warn? I showed you that picture before with all those houses there. There's Major's Pond right there. We knew that this block right here, Weber Avenue, and MacArthur Avenue right here, traditionally flooded since 1992. We've had six major floods there, so we knew when that area flooded. I predicted that that would come into that pond there, as I said before, because again, this is my life, this is what I study. Emergency services has been to me for God knows when. I came out of the Air Force, I've been doing it ever since. So for over 40 years, I've been involved in one shape or another in emergency response. Following things like this, and I'm not one of those chicken little sky is full of guys. I'm a realist. I take a look at it, and I determine what's gonna happen. And when things are getting bad, you know it. This whole area, right here, these two blocks were the ones in the past we were worried about. I knew that this was going to happen in here. You see, you've got this river right here, and it explodes right here, okay? We're going to talk a little bit about how the water came in, where it went from there. But it is a guessing game, because that's what happened with Irene, right? Everybody said, Irene's coming, Irene's coming, and everybody got into a panic and into a tizzy, and Irene went out. Predicting the path is... Hard. Hard at best. Okay? But you have to try and make some kind of effort for it. You have to look at all the models. For some reason, I don't know why I picked the English model or the European model. I mean, I just, for some reason, I just, with the moon and everything, the way it was mounting up, I just said, this is going to be the one. Where is it going to come to shore? You've got that whole eastern seaboard. The entire eastern seaboard can come anywhere. 
Where is it going to come aboard? And that's the critical thing. We talked about that 36, 37 miles before. Where is the eye going to make landfall? What time of day is it going to hit? Why is that so critical? Why is the time of day so critical? Ma'am? What do you think? Yeah, you. Um, if they're asleep, they're not going to be watching the news, maybe? Absolutely right. It's not rocket science, guys. People are sleeping. Nah, it's not going to hit. No big deal. And then all of a sudden, you're four foot deep in water in your house. That's the problem. Especially when the current came through as strong as it did with this. This wasn't just a raise up and everybody's got water. This was an absolute wall of water coming in at you. A wall of water that caused damage that you'll see in a little bit. Problem is, they won't leave. They don't leave. The people that you just told are in harm's way are not going to leave. The people in those two blocks, people in these two blocks right here, I've been through worse before. I'm not leaving. We've had flooding before. I'm not leaving. These two blocks right here. Okay? On those blocks, I've actually got police officers living. One officer, Terry Aaron, he's been there a long time. I can't really blame him, although he should have known better than to get out. Because you know where we took him out? Second floor window of the boat. Second floor window of the boat. Retired police officer, about 70 years old. But he had lived there all his life. These other two knuckleheads, and they are knuckleheads, bought their houses after they knew it was flooding that area. After they knew that that area flooded, he police officers being dealing with incidents there, they still bought houses there. I don't know about you, but you know, it's like taking a bullseye on your house saying, just come and destroy it. And it did destroy their houses. Absolutely incredible. But the majority of those people wouldn't leave. The majority of those people absolutely refused. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Can you afford to take action? Can you tie up your manpower to go in there and arrest them? Do you have the legal right to arrest them? If you don't do it, what's going to happen? Are you going to send your, res your responders in there? Put your fire at risk. Did you do that, Chief? Tough decision to make. Tough decision to make. Very tough decision to make. Because you've got a couple hundred people there. And they don't want to leave. <coughs> so, do you risk your responders to get them later? Can you afford not to take action and see what happens? Liability? Is there liability there? You better believe there is. As a manager, there's a lot of liability in there. What are you going to do? You better think about it before it happens. Because when it happens, you don't have time to think about it. I thought about it before it happened. I said, we're warning these people. For three days, we gave them reverse 911s. We had cert teams handing them fly. The mayor walked door to door and banged on every door and told every person, get the hell out. You know that big old governor of ours who got to ties up bridges in Fort Lee, New Jersey? <laughs> oh, he's heard about that, huh? <laughs> well, buddy Chris. I've met him several times. I'm not trying to get a meeting with him right now, but uh, I don't think he wants to meet with me. At any rate, um, what did he do uh, for Irene? He stood on the beach and he said, get the hell off the beach. Get out of here. This ain't a good place to be. <coughs> and they did for Irene. They didn't do it for Sandy. So what are you going to do with them? What are you going to do with these people? Well, like I say, I went for three days out there warning them, telling them to get out, telling them that we're not coming to get you. We're not coming to get you. At that staff meeting three days before that I was talking about, I told everybody in the room, and everybody in the room was in agreement. Once the storm hits, we're buffering down. We're not putting responders in jeopardy. I'm not having them get tangled up in live electric wires. I'm not handing your wife a flag saying you died as a hero, saving something that shouldn't have been there in the first place. I have a problem with that. So we told them to get out. We told them all the firemen, the first day, to stay bunkered down once the storm hits. Once the storm clears, we'll come and get them. What's left of them? <coughs> told everybody that. About six hours before the storm came, we had a smell of smoke in police headquarters. So I'm in the, the tab stairs in the EOC, 
Some local firemen and friends of mine came in, they checked the building, couldn't find where the smoke was coming from. As they're getting ready to leave, I look at Ray Deacon, I said, hey Ray, remember, we're not going out once this storm hits. Make sure your guys stay in. They looked at me and says, what are we going to do with the people? I says, you're not going out there. You'll leave them in there. He says, what are we going to do, let them drown? And I looked at him and I said, yes, that's exactly what you're going to do. Let them drown. Because I'm not putting your life in jeopardy. Firemen don't do that. Firemen save lives. Firemen save lives. If the house catches fire, do you expect it? Then they come and put it out. No, do you expect your house to catch fire? No. So it's taken by surprise, right? Okay. Firemen are going to rescue you? Yeah, because you were taken by surprise. You didn't know. But if your house, if you knew your house was going to catch on fire and you stayed in that house, should I send the fireman to save you? Shame on you. Shame on you. And that's shame on those people. And that's what I told them. They got mad and he walked out. Good. What firemen do? No, firemen don't put their lives in danger knowing that they're going to get killed or for a substantial risk like that when the people shouldn't have been there in the first place. That's a problem. But they did. Out they came. Floodwaters came out, started surging up, started getting deeper. People in the houses all of a sudden realized, oh no, it really is that bad. When their basement walls exploded as the surge of water came in from the ocean, came up the river, as their basement walls collapsed and their houses started to collapse, they started screaming and crying for help. And what did my fire chief do? He went down for them. He went down to get them. He went down to rescue those people. Problem is, that's not a rescue. That thing is not a rescue. Going down and getting people that shouldn't be there in the first place is not a rescue. On the other side of town, we had an area hit. Eight foot of water. Almost 80 people inside of an apartment. In the, uh, there was a um, welfare motel. We never expected the water to hit there. And those people were in jeopardy. They went in and the apartment went in there and rescued them. That's a rescue. Why? Because those people didn't expect be in harm's way. They didn't remain in harm's way after being told to go out. So the firemen do what firemen do then. Go into areas and rescue people who belong that needed to be rescued. Not those people on Weber Avenue. Not those people on the Garth Avenue. They shouldn't have gone there. But they did. But they did. Unfortunately. That apartment complex is about eight miles inland. That's not rainwater, guys. There was very little rain associated with standing. That's the Atlantic Ocean. What cost you to put your people out there? I have a problem, like I said. I really do. And I stood by my ground. Can you arrest them? How do you prepare for it? What I ended up doing after that, and this was a mistake on my part, because I didn't make the evacuation mandatory. Remember I told you, I made mistakes. That was my problem. I didn't make an inventory. So I couldn't go in there and arrest them. Since then, what have I done? I've rewritten declarations of emergency. See, an emergency declaration by your governor, by your, by your mayor, by whoever it is, it's all dependent upon how it's worded and the way it's written. I can say that I declare these three seats right here to be a state of emergency and that nobody can sit in them. You can sit all around them, but nobody can sit in them for three seats. It's all dependent on how you work. So we, I rewrote one of my declarations, and I've got it canned, ready to go. And what it basically says is anybody that remains in an area that's been ordered for a mandatory evacuation, anybody that remains in the area, anybody that fails to leave, anybody that enters that area, including police, fire, EMS, or anybody else, is going to be subject to arrest and or incarceration. And I will arrest a cop, I will arrest a fireman. I will fire a cop, I will fire a fire, even volunteers, if they fail to do the job. And going there to rescue those people, <coughs> use that word again, was a violation. That's a real serious issue. So you word your declaration to say that these people can't go in there. And then, if something happens, the liability is off of you. You have to be prepared for it, because it's going to happen. I have one guy come up in a big army, one of those big monsters, High water trucks. He said, well, I'll do it all those people in there. They don't want them out. I said, you're leaving there. Well, give them a magic marker. Let them write the social security number and their name and the next kid on the saw under our army. So when we want to get the bodies, we know where to get them. 
Okay, that works. Still got a body, no matter how you look at it. What are you going to do it You got to be prepared for it. That's part of Weber Avenue we were talking about. Okay, what about sheltering? What about sheltering? I said before, friends, family first, friends second, shelter third. A lot of things involved when you start opening up your shelter. Feeding and sleeping. Oh, that's easy. How many cots do you have? Do you have enough of them? When you start looking at hundreds of people coming your way, are they usable? When was the last time you actually pulled out the cots and used them? In the DPW, do you have a place for your DPW guys to rest? Do they have cots for that? Because you can't go 24-7, guys. We're going to talk a little bit about that in a little bit. You have to stay staff to work around the clock. How long can you maintain your operations? Okay? Where are you going to get additional people? Try your schools, your municipal workers, your still your wives, husbands and wives. They want to they want to help with the shelters. Because they want to feel that they can do something. So look at those untapped resources. One of the problems we have is food for the shelter. So what did we do? We brought the staff in from the schools and they actually cooked for the people. Fortunately, they cooked too good. <laughs> Security issues. You have security. Security is your responsibility if you're the guy managing that shelter. This is where we go back to the issue of the first aid squads we'll talk a little bit about in a minute. Have you screened your, your um, people? You have <coughs> Megan's Law in New Jersey, I guess it's Megan. Do you have Megan's Law here in Pennsylvania? Is the same thing? Do you have any of those people in your shelter? Do you know who those people are? You have drug people. People doing drugs in there. We actually had a guy and girl tried paying one of our cert kids, and these things were only kids fresh out of high school, tried paying them to go out and buy dope for them. In a shelter. Okay? So how do you identify that before it happens? You need to have people out there, spotters, in the crowd, people working in the crowd, talking to them, finding out what's happening in that shelter. People are going to get depressed. Is that person starting to look at depression? Okay? Things along those lines. This behavior, all the things that you think could happen in a large society are going to happen in that shelter. My standing orders, there'll be three police officers and two EMTs in my shelter at all times. The EMTs will have a transportable ambulance at all times. Unfortunately, that didn't work well. That didn't work well. Where are you going to get the food from? Have you made arrangements for your DPW guys to come in and get breaks? When they come off the road, have you got food there for them? You're going to be out of power. You're not going to have power for days on end. Have you prepared for that? Have you got backup generators? Does the shop right or the food town or one of the other grocery stores have backup generators? Have you made arrangements with them in advance to get food from them? And then once the power goes out and they say, oh, all well, this food's going bad, go for the take off their hands. They will give it to you because they'll write it off. So you have access to that stuff. But you're not going to get it if you don't think about it in advance and make it part of your plan. People are going to come from all walks of life. They're all looking for help. They're all looking for some explanation as to why this happened to the world. Are you going to be ready? Are you going to have the staff to do the jobs that have to be done? Medical issues, okay? You have to have those people there at all times. You need to have people there because things happen at the shelter. That was a problem I had, okay? You need to have medical spotters in there looking for disease, drug abuse, and depression, but you gotta have the medical people there. Another issue that I had. I gave a standing order that there shall be two EMTs and a transportable ambulance at that shelter at all times. Unfortunately, remember I said I like to throw rocks at first aid? This is where the rocks come in. We need first aid duck. Because my idiots pick and choose when they were gonna be there. Oh, well, you know, we don't want to be there late at night. People don't get sick late at night. <coughs> they would leave, they would come back, they would leave, they would come back. It got to the point where I actually went up there and threatened to nail the doors closed. <coughs> they didn't do their job. A council woman threatened to have me removed as the emergency management coordinator because I yelled at her children, the first aid squad. I told her, I don't care. The bottom line is, if you can't do your job, I don't need you. And you've got to be able to look in the mirror and say I'm doing a good job or I'm not doing a good job. If you're not doing a job, either do it better or step aside and let somebody else do it. And that was the problem with the first aid squad. Although they did one thing right. When the floodwaters hit and the police chief ordered their boat, ordered them out with their boats, they said, no, we're not going out. 
because we were told not to go out in that high water. So that was good. Problem was, the police chief went and took their boats and put the cops out there. We did not use the boats. So again, more issues, okay? More issues. But you need to take a look at those things beforehand so that you can prepare for them. <coughs> open up and open up, you're ready, okay? Keep a track of the evacuees, knowing who's there. Using your wristbands or whatever you want to use to track them, keep, keep an eye on them. Make sure that you've got their emergency contact information. Relocation addresses if they leave, so that when somebody comes looking for them to the shelter, you know where they're going to. Little things like that can really hurt the operation. Limit the ways in and out of those shelters. You want one way in, one way out. So that you don't have those kind of problems. Maintain communications with your emergency operations center so that you do have an idea of what's going on. Provide compassion, but not too much comfort. People are going to get comfortable there, especially people that don't have it as good at home as they do in a shelter. Believe it or not, that is true. They gotta be short-term places. You want to get them with family or friends, absolutely, because the more comfortable they get, the harder it's going to be to get them out. We had people bringing in pots of soup, cooking turkeys, bringing them down. People watching your kid, because the people, a lot, a lot of these people were welfare people, they ain't going to worry about watching because people from the shelter are watching them for them. When we finally, after seven days, we had, I went ahead and shut the shelter down, I got a phone call from the Red Cross, they said, look, we're opening up a thousand man shelter up at Rutgers. Um, would you like to use it? I said, I'll call you right back. Called up the mayor and the council. I said, everybody meet me at the shelter. Called up my transport, transportation coordinator. I said, I have two buses at the shelter. We walked in. I looked around. I said, you know what? We are about to have a hell of a pandemic here. Because they didn't have showers. Okay? They banned the school, so they didn't have showers. So right then and there, I walked in. We closed down the shelter. I had a woman coming up to me and said, I don't want to leave. I'm too comfortable here. It's nice. We got a big screen TV here. I got people, games for, for my kids to play and whatnot. People get comfortable. They're eating good. So if you're going to buy a shelter, tuna fish, peanut butter and jelly, and hot dogs. I recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, here comes the storm. You better be prepared before it hits because once it gets there, you're going to have a problem. This is where we talked about fuel. Where do you guys get your fuel from for your equipment? Where is it stored? What kind of pumps do you have? You have back your generators on those pumps. The power goes out. When a refinery shuts down, do you have procurement contracts with another refinery out of the area to get that fuel to come in? Those are little things that are going to make or break your operation, guys. You don't have the fuel, the trucks can't go. If you don't have a way to transport the fuel, portable pumps, your sewer pumps. All right, we lost eight sanitary sewer pumps. Every one of them for the cover we lost because the motors went under water. Not the motors, the uh, backup generators up there went under water. So we had nothing. So now where do you get the generators to work out? Why is that so important? Why, why do I need that, that sump pump all of a sudden, sorry? Let's get the water out. Get the water out, more importantly, the sewage. That sewage is coming up. It's going into the streets. Okay? It starts to back up. It starts to build up. That becomes a major health problem. What's that? Typhoid. Typhoid and everything else. All of it that comes along with it. That becomes a serious problem. And you guys are the ones that deal with it. So you've got to make sure you've got fuel. You've got to make sure that you can get more. Where are you going to get it? Would you be willing to hijack a fuel truck if you had to? I did. <laughs> Swear to God. We're not riding down the road. We've been scratching our head for over two days trying to figure out where we're going to get fuel. I got the chief of police sitting next to me, and his truck goes by. <laughs> I looked at John. I said, what do you think is in the truck? He says, I don't know. That. I, says, I guess we're going to have to find out. Well, you see that black suburban out front here, just in front of the things, all kinds of crazy lights on and everything. <laughs> Pulled him over. Sure did. Walked up to him and says, uh, what you got in the truck? Fuel. Where you going? Steel belt. I don't think so. Follow me. And I put another police car behind him. So we brought it right to police headquarters, parked it in the back. Guy was all upset and everything. Uh, he says, my boss is going to be real mad. Okay, call your boss. So he called his boss and he says, hey, 
I hate to tell you, but we got your fuel truck. How much is it worth? That VA business administrator right there will write the check for you right now. That's what we did. We wrote him a check for the cost of the fuel. Right there on the spot. Hijack the fuel truck, though. You gotta do things like that, guys, if you don't have it prepared in advance. You have small trucks with maybe 250, 500 gallons on them that you can get into some of your remote areas if you need to. You have the generators to do that type of stuff. Or are your facilities secured? As this storm's coming in, you have buildings such as here with big glass plate windows that if something was flying through, you can come through. Have you prepared that? Have you taken that and boarded it up a little bit? Have you taken your personal items or have you told the public to take their personal items and raise them up off the ground to get them into a safe location? Backup pumps, generators, the whole nine yards. All part of it. You need to work out a shift schedule too. Again, you know, I, I looked at some of my DPW guys and uh, they went 24, 36 hours at a clip. You can't do that, guys. You as managers need to set a limit and it's got to be 12 hours. You want to do an hour overlap, that's fine. 12 hours. There's a couple of things that are going to happen. First of all, your people are going to get burned out. <clears throat> Second of all, they've got family lives too. They've got homes. They've got to get to that home and spend a little time with their family. Make sure that their houses can get good and work in order that their families can work in order. Because remember, they're not going to have power either. So you've got to take a look at that. Make sure that you, and enforce it. If the guy doesn't want to leave, no, no, you're done. You don't got to go home, you don't got to go home, but you can't stay here, yeah. Because if not, they're going to stay. I had people working at a shelter, they, they weren't going to leave until finally the one girl I told my shelter coordinator, I said, call her husband and have him come down here and pick her up right now. Because people want to help. They want to do the right thing. But by burning out, you're not doing the right thing. So you need to have that. And I enforce that with myself and my coordinator. I would work from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. He would work from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. We had an, over, an hour overlap. I'm the boss, so I work day shift. He worked nights. That's just, that's just the way the axe falls, guys. But again, 16 hours is too much, guys. 16 hours is too much. You're going to burn out. All right. Storm's hit. All outside operations have to stop. Well, they didn't, as we said before. They didn't. Things kept going. People kept going out there for the storm. Everyone was supposed to seek shelter, and they didn't, unfortunately. Damage, deaths. That was the main thing, obviously. We lost, I think, 40... I want to say 41 people died in Jersey from the storm. Vehicles, thousands. Buildings, thousands. Injuries, in the hundreds. It's all part of it, though. You have to be prepared to deal with it. Now it's clear. You got to do a quick assessment. DPW's got to get out there and do those dashboard assessments. Your um, elected officials need to go out there. FEMA's going to be coming in. You got to do a quick dashboard assessment of what's going on out there. The key facilities are the ones you want to look at first. Your DPW garages, your police departments, your firehouses. Look at the facilities that are going to support operations over the next 10 or 12 days. Make sure that they are functioning first. Private houses you can get a little bit later, things like that. But the facilities that you need to get the continuity of your community back up and running again is critical. So you need to get out there and do that. Public shelters, the whole nine yards. Right there. 11 foot 9 inches, 8.5 miles inland. That's no joke, guys. That's from a female map right there. That's Bordentown Avenue. All these houses, there's 60 houses here. 11 foot 9 inches of water over 8.5 miles inland. That was the surge. The buildings were just absolutely demolished. This area here is Route 35 in the Old Bridge section. You know what houses I was talking about? Right over here. Those two little streets. Demolished, 11. 13 foot. Garden State Parkway is right over in here. 13 foot over the Garden State Parkway. It took all of this, nice and serene house. Those, those, those houses I'm going to show you in a minute, right there. Nice and serene. Everything was beautiful the day before, right? That's the Rarity Bay. That's Staten Island, New York, right there. South End, well, that's the mouth of the river right there. That's where the river comes in. Nice, beautiful, relaxing day. That's Union Beach, the place I told you got washed away down there. And what did the storm do? That. 
houses destroyed, the debris. How do you clean this up? Where do you start? Where do you put it? <coughs> Boat for sale. We got a yard. Houses just flat. This is all debris that you've got to find a way of cleaning up and sorting out. Yeah. Houses washed away. This marina right here, and you talk about the the uh, global warming. We talked about okay. Water is hot. Water is rising. This bulkhead right here is the Viking Marina. You can see the boats in the land that got washed back up in here. When I was a kid, back in the 50s and 60s, my uncle had a boat there in that marina. High tide, the water was always at least that much below the bulkhead. On a full moon high tide, you got a little bit of water in this parking lot, a little bit. Over the years, I watched that tide go up. Now, high tide is in the parking lot, full moon high tide, for that. All right. Full high tide is out on Route 35. The water has risen at least this much in the past 30 years in that area. I know that for a fact because I know what it was before. And that's why when people tell me it's nonsense, I can tell them no. I can look right there. This bulkhead now that was washed away, they are replacing it with four foot. They're in the process as we speak of raising this up four foot. Right up here, steel pilings and everything else. What do you do with the boats that are floating around your neighborhood, the debris, the downed trees? You see all the boats in the background through here. That building was three stories high. The bottom two floors got washed away. What do you do with all those boats? You're just blocking a highway, blocking a road. How are you getting your equipment through there? All those boats are on top of a railroad bridge. <coughs> I believe when we counted them, there were six of them there. There's a gang box in there, too, somewhere in the debris, construction gang box. That house went for a little ride. That's down in uh, Manilow, can I believe? Barnegat Bay. Huh? Barnegat Bay. Barnegat Bay, yep. Teams are trained in advance. You've got to pre-identify your people. Train your people to go out and look for this damage, okay? Take, again, this is all part of a pre-plan. <clears throat> Training the people, wherever they are, to go out and do whatever they have to do to take the stamps. You may have to give them some cheap cameras, digital cameras, to go out there and take pictures so that you have an assessment of what's going on. You've got to take a look at the entire community, the entire county. You've got to know what's happened so you can identify where the primary spots are and where the secondary spots are. Where are you going to go first and where are you going to go later? What about the down wires? Miles and miles and miles of wires. I was asked to testify before the Board of Public Utilities in New Jersey about uh, eight months after the storm. They were tearing up JCP on Jersey Central Power and Light. They were ripping them up. Oh, they were terrible, terrible. Jersey Central did a horrible job. Absolutely horrendous job. We didn't have power, we didn't have this, that, and the next thing. So I was asked to go down and talk at the Board of Public Utilities meeting, testify before their panel. When you do an act, you actually testify before a judge, which I never did before. Well, in comes this group of senior citizens, all in yellow shirts. They're all the coalition against Jersey Central, because Jersey Central let them down. And one of their people got up, and he was a freeholder, an elected official from the Monmouth yeah. County. He got up and he says, my constituents were inconvenienced. They were in, they, they didn't have power for so many days. They were inconvenienced. They shouldn't have, Jersey Central should do a much better job than this. Well, one mistake he made was going before me because I got up and spoke next. I walked up and I says, Your Honor, I says, uh, I'd like to tell a freeholder, yes, you're right. I feel very bad that your constituents here were inconvenienced. I said, Your Honor, let me tell you something. On the way down here, I counted, and I did this on purpose, and on one mile stretch, 32, on one mile stretch, 32 poles, and they had 14 wires on. That's one mile. 32 poles, 14 wires. You do the math. Think about how many thousands and hundreds of thousands of poles, how many millions of miles of wire we're talking about, that just got hit with a major, major storm. I said, so you're right, I feel bad that they're in confusion. Let me tell you something, Your Honor. Let me tell you something, Freeholder. I would take the inconvenience that they went through for anything compared to what my people are going through 
is I still come where a thousand people that don't have a house, that don't have a home to go to, that their kids can't go back to the schools. Things washed away, things destroyed. So the inconvenience that your people went through, my heart bleeds for them. Why don't they take it to some of my people that don't have a house? And with that, the PPU meeting was pretty much brought to a uh, rousing end, shall we say. Because I tell it like it is, guys. I, I don't sugarcoat it, I tell it like it is. Look for the hidden hazards. You guys that are out there, I'm talking, who's got the trees? Tree, tree trimmer. Okay? That, that hazard waiting to happen? Cliff, right? Yes. That's a hazard waiting to happen, isn't it? Why is things still with that? You don't see them? That's why you need to get out there. <coughs> and yeah, you don't have power, maybe, but what about the back power? The power that's being fed back yeah. through generators. Or somebody all of a sudden, hey, we can turn this area out and zap, turn it on. And you guys are out there working in this stuff. Wires into how trees into houses, wires down all over, and you gotta try and make a way to get in there? To try and get this debris cleaned up? How? Do you have the equipment to do it? That was, I believe, Lava Left, if I'm not mistaken, was it Tim? Yes. Bunch of houses right there. What do you think caused the houses to burn? Gas. Okay? Gas leak? Kit that you don't turn off the gas, what happens when a pilot light goes out and the gas keeps coming in? Okay, maybe <coughs> problem. Can you get to the utilities to turn them off before it becomes an incineration? This is one of those police officers' houses I was telling you about. Okay? Donnie is about this tall, got three little kids, and a very nice wife. And he decided he was going to ride the storm out. Well, he had about nine feet of water when that wall collapsed. And he had to get his family out. And he said, Barry, all we could do was bob up and down like this to try to keep our, catch our breath because we couldn't touch the ground the entire time. Him and his little kids bobbing up and down in the water trying to get the hell out of there. When he was told not to be there in the first place. And he's a cop and he should have known better. If one of those kids had drowned, how could he live with himself? Okay? The surges came in with such force as they came in from the ocean, or in from the, uh, from the river, because that's what happened, came down the river. As it came in, the surge was so powerful, it blew the front walls away, the foundations, and it came in. And once the surge stopped, it went back out almost as quickly as it came in. And what did it do to the back walls? The same thing. So you have foundations collapsed front and back. Houses. How, how some of them stood, stood standing there is absolutely a miracle. Foundation after foundation. What's that right there? Fuel tank. Fuel tank. Not an issue? You better believe it is. Life safety and stabilization, property conservation, as I said before. Those are the key priorities that you gotta worry about. Wires down, all over the place. No sanitary lift stations. No fuel to get them up and running. Can't get food, can't get water, you can't get ice. You are in a world of hurt right now, ladies and gentlemen. What do you do with your main intersection, the roadways? Because if you don't have power, the traffic lights don't work. Well, I don't know how you guys do the jug handles here. I understand other states are not as strange as Jersey, where we have the jug handles, and they take the jug handle, they come across here. Well, we ended up having to take buses. You gotta think outside the box. You gotta think outside the box a little bit. But you gotta think about it in advance. When you're sitting down in these planning meetings, Sit down and say, what if, and look at all the possible scenarios. Everything that could happen, you need to look at. <coughs> have you got locations for points of distribution for water and ice? Have you identified those places? Do you have the tools you need? Do you have a forklift there to take some water and the ice off of the trucks so that you can give it to the residents? Do you have enough manpower to man those points of distribution? DPW is going to play a major part in that because that's some of the things that the public needs. How do you get the information to the public? What are you going to tell them? There it is, down there again. Now looking. And I, that's not too far from the house that was floating out there before. This is a major roadway right through here, by the way. The breeze is everywhere, okay? Your utilities have all been shut down, you've got nothing going. You have to look at the identifier, look at the uh, hazmats, you've got to get the roadway cleared. The fire department's got to get through. Your first day you've got to get through. In the first early hours after the storm, how do you get them through with the roads all blocked? 
Do you have a front end loader going with that fire truck to push any debris out of the way so the fire truck can get in? Or the ambulance can get in? Have you sat down with the fire chief at first aid point and said, if somebody has a heart attack, how do we get the squad to that? With all the wires in the trees and everything blocking the roadway. That's part of the plan. That's why you're so critical. That's why you're so important. You all rest on where you guys are. And the debris's gotta come. You have a place for concrete? <coughs> debris everywhere. Getting out to the curb, what's trash, what's not. People are gonna come by, you're gonna have scavengers coming out there, taking some of the stuff, going through it, picking through the stuff. Yeah, you're gonna have looting. You have the equipment, you have the manpower. Because health is gonna be an issue. The longer it sits there, the longer it goes. And people are gonna put stuff out there that you're not gonna believe. Piles after piles of the grid. Believe me, you don't have an idea. I think this was absolutely incredible. The, uh, one of the council women asked if she could uh, handle the coordination of the donations. I looked at her and I said, Lisa, are you out of your mind? Do you have any idea what you're gonna get? She said, Barry, I really wanna do it. I wanna help, I wanna, I wanna handle the donations. I said, Lisa, if you wanna do it, I'll give you a staff to do it. When you get your first bowling ball donated, let me know. She thought I was kidding. People are gonna donate anything and everything. They wanna feel good about themselves. They wanna help. They're gonna donate to for Katrina, they were getting fur coats. So who the hell needs a fur coat in the middle of Louisiana in the summer? <laughs> All right? But that's what happened. People wanna, and it's not that they're bad. The, other, the people wanna donate. They wanna help in any way they can. By cleaning out their attic and cleaning out their garage, the husband's doing great because now he don't have to take it to the dump, take everything out and donate it. Because the wife told him to get it out of there. But that's what's gonna happen. You're gonna have stuff coming at you like you wouldn't believe. Debris all over the place, houses. Everything's gone, man. It's all gone. Piles on top of piles. Where do you put it? Where do you put it? House after house, foundation blown away. Dreams blown away. Just keep on piling up. They all may get through, though. They all may always get through. I, wrote a, I, I didn't know this. I wrote a mailman a ticket once. You can't write a mailman a ticket. I didn't know that. I wrote him a ticket. He never paid her nothing. Guy, I was amazed. I, I had no reason to write him a ticket, though. He was driving like a jerk. I was parked on a corner doing a road job, and he came up because I was parked on a corner. He pulled up. He says, "Well, I parked there." Now, mind you, there was nobody behind me. There was nobody in front. He says, "That's where I parked." I said, well, get up across the street. What's the big deal? Go, go. I got kicked by your just for a goddamn cop. And he turns around and he swings back out. He goes right through the stop sign, right across from the main intersection. So, yeah, you got a ticket. <laughs> of course, didn't do him any good because you can't ride the mail on ticket. But no one gave up. As much as the debris kept coming, they kept coming. See them guys there? See these loaders? They're from a neighboring town because Cerebral didn't have. There's several 17 square miles. We've got 50,000 people. Our DPW is working on the soles of their shoes, shall we say, because they don't have the support. The mayor and council won't give them the tools they need to do the job. If it weren't for Woodbridge DPW, we'd still be out there collecting stuff. Woodbridge came in with 30 trucks and 60 people and started helping us out. And I will never be able to thank them enough for what they did. But that's their equipment in there, because Sarah will want to spend the money. But look at the break. All the equipment. And we're pretty DPW that would have heck of a job for us. Now, can you save any money? Because that's what it all comes down to. That's what it all comes down to is the cost when you get done looking at the bottom line. You gotta start looking at recycling. That's part of it. Believe it or not, you know, we can't just, and you guys should know, I'm sure you do, you can't just throw anything anywhere you want. There's laws out there. So we gotta take, take a long, hard look at the recycling. Do we have a system set up in advance to deal with that? Staging locations. Instead of taking it from here to the dump, maybe it's 12 miles away, maybe it's six miles away, you have a staging location someplace that you can dump the debris temporarily to get it out of the neighborhoods and then resort it later and get it out of there. And if you do have the locations pre-identified, have you got the permits from the EPA? Because that becomes an issue. 
We identified two locations in town where we could stage it. One was for tree debris, things like that. The other was for household debris. So identify in advance, get those permits out there, because when it comes, you don't want to take the time. The outside contractors are going to save you money if you have them on procurement contracts. If you have them already identified and the equipment identified, they're going to save you money. All right? They don't have a lot of the labor issues that we've got when we talk about civil service and things like that as we do in New Jersey. So you want to like to look at that. But here's the key. You've got to do it before the storm hits. Because once the storm hits, what's happening to the price right off the bat? Price is going through the roof. And you know what? It's going to go to the highest bidder. So even though you've got an agreement with the guy, if you don't have a contract with him, he's going to go somewhere else. Name the game. You need to take a look at that. Portage jobs. Have you identified where you, you've got your guys out there working with time? Have you identified where you're going to get your portage jobs from? Something as simple as that. Have a plan beforehand, guys. Be ready for it because it's coming. Where are you going to get those dumpsters? Who gets them first? Again, if you don't have those things that lined up in advance, somebody else is going to get them for you. And you're going to be standing there wishing you had them. Hazmats. Again, people are going to clean out their homes. They're going to bring stuff out that's going to be a hazard to you and your people. Make sure that you'll look at it in advance. What do we got right here? Propane. Probably a propane tank, right? <clears throat> Over here, another propane tank. Take out this whole house right here. That whole front wall was gone. The only thing holding it up was that set of stairs. And the guy's a Devils fan anyway, so that makes it even worse. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, what this house is now, they actually, this is Weber Avenue. All these houses are going to be torn down. This guy actually built his house up on stanchions. He's 12 feet high now. Up on my one. Put a monitor up on it. More stuff, though. Do your people have, do you have enough gloves for them? Do you have face protection for them? You may not be able to get them once the storm hits. You want to have that stuff prepared. This thing had about, uh, I guess, about eight, nine feet of water right in this area here. All the chemicals that are in there, all the oils that are in there, all over the street, all over the neighborhood. Long-term recovery is going to add up. The costs are going to be high. Okay? Some of the costs you're going to identify before the storm. Some of the costs you're going to identify after the storm hits. Some of the costs you're never going to get back. Some of them you're never going to be able to recover. The documentation is key. That's why anybody who works here in the DPW offices, ladies, which uh, you work at, keep track of minute, uh, hours and stuff like that? And the FEMA check, yes. All of that fives are mine. Every, everything for Sandy was mine. Everything was yours. Did, when FEMA came in, did they give you all the documents that they wanted to fill out? FEMA was a nightmare. We had a different person every day. We had different requirements. Well, we had federal government. They wanted GPS coordinates for trees. Um, they wanted to know when we planted all the trees that came down at Sandy. My answer, God, apparently didn't go real far. Um, <laughs> The dumpster debris removal was an issue with them. We staged every firehouse, mm -hmm. and FEMA, and then FEMA came back and said it actually wasn't sandy debris. We were actually just hauling away debris for the firehouses because the location was on the bill. Yeah. So if it wasn't for shop and waste management, we would have lost all of that money. But I mean, it's just dealing with them. Just start writing everything down. And the man hours, the tonnage, the tipping and, fees, and everything. All well, that can adds up, guys. And pictures. Pictures. As it was happening, they wanted every dash cam picture as it's happening. You said this where it was flooded, proved that it was flooded. They actually didn't believe that. The key here, the key here is getting the documents that you need from FEMA beforehand, knowing what they're asking for beforehand, and being comfortable with those documents that you can provide it for them in a rapid fall and rapid motion. Because it takes forever to get this money rolling. So you gotta be comfortable with the forms. If you don't like the forms and you gotta make something up, and I tell people, you know, make it user friendly. But make sure you've captured the information that they need because that's what they're going to come after. And they're going to, they're going to turn you down. They're going to reject it. And as managers, as supervisors, keep track of your man hours that way. The equipment that you use, when you're driving a dump truck, that not only are you getting the overtime for the operator, you're getting for, for the equipment, for the truck. That all adds up. Chainsaws, generators, you're using those pieces of equipment. FEMA's going to pay you for them. So you've got to document everything. Document all of that paperwork. For police cars alone, just police cars, I got back $330,000 just for the use, not the man hours inside of them, just for the use of the police cars, $330,000 I got back. Just on that. 
I had $89 million worth of damage, but we're still trying to figure that out. You need to take track of that money, where it's going. You're going to have people, stores, washed away, debris. People are going to be out of work. That hurts your community. The faster you can get this store cleaned out, the faster they can get it done back up and running, the faster your community is going to come back. <laughs> Some of them are never going to reopen. Just demolished, washed away. What do you do with all that metal? How do you get in there to get it safely? We get it out there safely so that nobody gets hurt. That's the Osprey Bar right there. Okay? I can tell you I spent a lot of time going in and out of that door. <laughs> A lot of time, I gotta tell you. Then were the days. I fell asleep on a beach one day, roller skating. You don't know how that happened. The only way, so the kid comes up and he says, Mr. Mr., my mom says I gotta leave. Can you go to my town now? Okay. But again, all that sand, how you gonna move it? It's in the cars down the road. That's all part of main drag right there. All the boats, all stuff coming to get you. Marinas. Ongoing security, again, you can't, you can't just leave them abandoned. They have no place to go. You've got to put police officers in there. You've got to put other people in there. Road closures for days on end. It's going to hurt the wallets, okay? Clothing, personal items, all that stuff, the contractor bills. The relocation, where the, if they leave their homes and they get out of the shelter at some point, are they going to be able to get money for lodging? And lost Lost, way, uh, lost wages. One of the key things with the brief, with um, emergency responses, or uh, I'm sorry, with um, major incidents like this is, the key is getting the schools open first. The faster you get your schools open, and that's why we want to get in there and identify whether they're damaged or not, the faster the schools are open, the faster you're going to be able to get your community back up and running. Because the parents need to get to work. The parents need to get a sense of normalcy. The children need to get that sense of normalcy. So your priority really needs to be focused on, after life safety, getting those schools back up again. How do you start again? Okay, again, physically, obviously the cuts and bruises, the emotional loss, long-term, depression, the drug abuse, alcohol abuse, all part of what you're dealing with. And it's never gonna be the same for a lot of these people. A lot of these people are moved, moved away, overtime, contractors, all equipment. Have you dealt with fuel lines? How are you going to deal with that? Because that's what's going to happen. What do you think happens when people like that start standing in line? Fights. Fights. Okay? Fights with gasoline. <laughs> Not a good thing from a fire point of view. I've got to tell you. Not a good thing. Line after line after line. Security at those lines. Well, there's a donut shop. <laughs> There's, there's the guy with the donut shop right there. <laughs> Believe it or not, they're actually giving him a Harley. He's the head of our traffic bureau. They're giving him a Harley. Gotta help the tires. <laughs> but it does. Even the, fabric, the fabricated community suffers. It really does, guys. It, it, it's just like these. Families move away. Friendships are lost. Schools. Neighbors turn on neighbors. I actually saw that happen. You don't want to sell your house? I want to move, I want the house sold. If you don't want to sell your house, it's going to be a problem because people will buy my house if you don't sell your house. But things kind of work their way around. Yesterday's dreams lost, but they came together as a team, as a community. As a team, as a community. You guys got to work together as a team. We did what we could. Uh, we're still fighting it. Hopefully, uh, someday it will be over. I've got FEMA back in my office now already. They came out the first time, didn't like it, came back the second time, the third time. You can't stop Mother Nature. You can't stop Mother Nature, but you can be prepared, guys. You can be prepared for all of this that's coming at you. Build a team, surround yourself with quality people, train, 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 communicate, make sure everybody understands what's going on. Be a strong leader but an approachable leader. Keep an open mind. What would a Hurricane Sandy presentation be without Seaside's famous roller coaster in the ocean? <laughs> never say it could never happen here, guys. Because at 11 foot 9 inches of water, 8.5 miles inland, I can tell you it will. Questions? Sir? What was the role of the National Guard? 
National Guard played a role throughout the county, mainly they were transporting, helping with the transport of fuel. Um, they were at some of the uh, larger shelters, they had National Guard personnel there. Uh, but again, they, they really didn't have a major operation in our part of the party. Sorry, good questions. <clears throat> One is uh, in regards to the debris management uh, centers that you have. Mm -hmm. Are they still open or are you still cleaning out the debris there? We're getting more debris now. Um, what happened was there was a group called the uh, South, South, South Carolina Baptist Men's, Baptist Men's Group, I believe it is. It was a church group that came in and what they did was they, they, they called them mudded out the houses. They needed a house that was seriously damaged with a lot of water. They came in first, cleaned a lot of the stuff out. That got most of the stuff out on the street quickly. But we're still getting some stuff now, some of the houses that have been abandoned all along. People are starting to buy some of them, but some of the people aren't, the ones that aren't being sold, the people are starting to now go back to, so we are getting more debris now. But now it can't be attributed to sin because it's, you've only got a window, and that window is already closed. So now all the debris is on, on a community. Second question is uh, pets. Yeah, yeah. How did you how did you deal with pets and you know dogs roaming around there? We didn't have a major problem with the wild animals roaming around. But one of the problems you're going to find is people are not going to leave their homes with, without their pets. They're not. I, I wouldn't do it with my my dog. Okay, fuzzy old hairy thing, but it's beautiful. But um, what we did was we did not have a Red Cross shelter ourselves. The shelter in my town was run by the community and we determined years ago that we were going to be pet friendly. So we took it, it was an abandoned school, we took the third floor of the school and we made that basically where the pets were. If you wanted to bring your pet to the shelter you had to bring a cage of some sort, you had to feed it and you had to come up you know, every several hours to check on it make sure that it was okay. Uh, as far as wild animals roaming, not too much, uh, but if you go back to Katrina you saw some of the, you saw some of the pictures of the animals down there. Um, I mean, I personally didn't see a lot up here, but yeah, it's, it's a major issue. You have to be prepared for it. You, you, can't, you can't leave your pets. If I might, in Katrina, down the long, right along the Gulf Coast, uh, the highway down there, it almost felt like you were driving on carpet because of the roadkill. The animals migrated to the higher ground as the waters continued to rise, and then they either drowned there or got struck by the responders coming in. And it was, I mean, that, that in its own right becomes a major health safety issue. Something that, you know, how do you respond to that? That's a damn good question. Other questions, sir? To what extent had uh, you done debris planning before the event? And knowing what you know now, what would you recommend folks focus their planning efforts on? I think, first of all, the town leaders need to identify that they have to be prepared for this themselves because they're going to blind eye. Town leaders, the mayors, the councils, they, they, they never want to spend money on these things. So I would make sure that I had more heavy equipment because we didn't have a lot of heavy equipment. Um, I would have more DPW people working, obviously. Uh, I would have the staging areas pre identified. We didn't have them pre identified before the storm. Um, recycling, the sorting, bringing stuff in like that. Using volunteers. Using volunteers, training them, basically. You know, you're, you're not training them to a you know, sit down stay out of the classroom thing. You know, you don't touch wires and obviously you move on with a supervisor, you know, somebody that's gonna be able to manage them. But I have the volunteers go out there and do that because they do want to help. You gotta bring people in. But it, it, it's a task, it really is to sit down and plan. We didn't plan for We had no we had no idea, you know, I knew this thing was coming, but nobody listened to me. You know, chicken little, chicken little, and then when it hits all of a sudden it said, Oh boy, it was a we'll get a little deeper into that as we go forward. To your question. Yeah, I just had a question. How did you, how did your DPW staff organize? So did you have, did they have their own operation centers or did you have a lot of extra debris staff in the EOCs? And then how did you integrate the out, the, the, the other Woodbridge uh, staff that was coming in as well? How did, how did you coordinate with worked, them? The main staff worked on, under an ICS based, uh, based system. They worked out of the DPW and Public Works of Rod, which was downtown, not very far from the main location of the flood, <coughs> about six blocks away. Uh, our EOC was on the other side of town. We had a representative from um, from um, DPW in the EOC at all times, and then the supervisors had different areas of the town broken down that they were in charge of, and certain groups that they were in charge of. So when the Baptist guys came in, they had a supervisor with them to help identify what was being cleaned out. Uh, when Woodbridge came in, they came in with their supervisors, and they actually came in on a Saturday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, three days to help us out with that. 
Yeah, it's an issue. Sir? Did you have to have JCP and I'll turn power off, or did it just get so cool that you have to do that? No, we actually, we actually turned them off. We, uh, we had areas that we shut down uh, to try to save the grid. JCP and I'll get to do it to save the grid. Um, we have a power plant uh, in our town, right on right on the river, actually, and they knew that that was going to go under significantly. So they shut the grid down there. Um, they shut the grid down in Keyport. Uh, I think they shut down three or four up in that immediate area. But you had to beforehand. They knew, they knew the issue was going to be wires coming back, things re-energizing. But again, now you're talking about people with generators, you know, back feeding, things like that, and people not knowing how to hook up these generators. You know, you got rocket scientists out there. Oh, you just put these wires together. It's science. Yeah. And then the guy gets electrocuted. CO, carbon monoxide. People running generators either in their houses or in their basements. Believe me, these people, some of these people, guys, you look at them and you say, where do they get their education? And the common stuff that you all would think about, a lot of these people just don't think about. So if you turn the power off in the neighborhoods, you would be flooded? Yeah. Shut it off. Well, we shut it off. As the storm started to hit, it was the water was coming up. It was down as it started to build up in a bay. It started coming up the river. They shut it down probably about an hour before the actual grid went underneath. After that, it was down for a long time. We didn't have power for over ten days. Sorry. So, what were your cell towers like? What's your main uh, communication? Most of the cell towers were not in too bad a shape. Um, they are none were located in the flood areas. Uh, most of them all had gener backup generators and things along those lines. So it wasn't too bad with the cell service overall. I mean, we did have spy reception here and there. There were certain areas that were up and down, up and down, up and down because of the volume. Um, so that became a problem. You know, the call volume was really you know, starting to kick up high. But uh, overall, your main, you said your main method is radios? Or yeah. Cell phone? Radios. radios was the main method, yeah. But again, that was dependent on generators. I was fortunate enough, I had written a grant about five years before and I actually put fire generators in each of the firehouses, generators in both of the first aid squads, generator, generator in the police department, and a generator in a shelter. So those generators in those key places became the hub of that neighborhood. People could come there to get information, they could come there to get you know, uh, food and water because we had um, our DPW or our auxiliary, uh, fire auxiliaries and stuff like that cooking. So the backup generators were the key. But keeping them fueled was the problem. Because again, you know, you're dealing with diesel. I, if I had to do it over now, I'd probably go natural gas. Probably go natural gas because I think that that, at least there, for the most part, you're in good shape. The fuel really, really, uh, guys, your fuels will kill you. Yeah. Did your DOC uh, sustain any damage? Uh, we had some damage from water coming into one side, but that's an ongoing problem that we've had. As a matter of fact, when I go back, I'm going to yell at the DPW guy again because he can't, he can't fix it for whatever reason. But no, for the most part, we were bad. We were okay. The problem came in, though. The building was built in um, 1980 and 81. And when they put the generator in that particular building, that generator, that building did have a generator in it. They used 1970s technology, only wiring certain areas. Okay? You know, key, key points that they felt at the time were significant. Instead of now, when you put an auxiliary generator in, it's, it's designed to power up the entire building, you don't lose anything. So we actually had to run extension cords all over the place, because now we've got a computer room there, you know, all different stuff all over. So we had to really, we had to go up and, I don't, don't want to say, hijack or ransack a hardware store. We had to go to the hardware store, bring the guy in, we want a dozen cables, we want this, we want that, we want that, and just wire it all the way through. But yeah, that's... Do you have a backup plan in place if uh, that building becomes unusable? Yes. Uh, I'm not real happy with the backup plan. It's our borough hall, uh, which doesn't have a backup generator. We're actually in the process of writing a grant right now uh, that I have to have anybody in the month for that. Um, but that will be our, our next EOC. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to change that myself if I can get the mayor and council permission, the first aid squad, who again thinks that they don't have first aid calls, um, their building is located dead center of town and has the capabilities of being a very good backup POC. So if I'm around long enough, I'm going to comment through that building too. Sir? Do you have any um, incompatibility issues between jurisdictional radios? Like you couldn't talk to the next town over? Or yeah. Is there everybody? No, it is. Absolutely the problem. Absolutely. Because again, uh, in, in Jersey, you've got 800, you got 500, you got um, you know the digital versus the analog. And I, I know two things about radios: you push to talk, you release to listen. That's really what I know about radios. But uh, they have a problem. Um, 
they're trying, I, I believe they're trying to address that problem by going county dispatch at some point. Uh, but that, that's probably about seven, eight years down the road. During the height of the start, how did you keep the uh, roadways open for emergency vehicles, firemen, and things like that? What I had done with the DPW was if they had to go out, I wanted a front end loader at each one of the firehouses and at the um, first aid squad. And that if they had a call to go on, that front end loader would go. Or what I also had to do was put the plows on. I had to put snow plows on the trucks so that if push came to shove, plow could go down the road, push the debris off to the side to let the fire trucks go through. Uh, we didn't have to do too much now. I think we only had to really go on three calls before the road really started. But some of the road got open. A lot of roads were permanently closed for days off. And what they had routes around them that you could go to. But yeah, I would, I would recommend considering plows and uh, front end loaders having them at the firehouses so that when something like that happens, they can get out there. Sir? Uh, unified Command, obviously you have uh, new personalities involved in Unified Command. How do, you, how do you wrestle with the decision that is it is clear the correct decision and you have these personalities fighting it out? Uh, how, did you, how did you get over that? One of the things, when I do Unified Command, I, everybody sitting at the table is equal. Okay, whether you're a police chief or you're, you're you know, like, kind of taking care of people sitting at that table. Um, the key there is having a good moderator, a good Unified Command spokesman, I guess, is the guy. He's the guy that's going to not allow that police chief to take over the conversation. He's the guy that's not going to allow, you know, somebody else to inject and overpower those eight personalities. And that's really the key, is having a guy there that knows I ICS, and can really manage it. He can look at the police chief and say, hey, hold it. You made your point now. I want to hear what he has to say. And you try and get that common ground. The, the smaller the team, the easier it's going to be to get consensus. If you start bringing a, a whole bunch of people to the table, you're never going to get consensus. But you want to have the key people there that are going to identify the problem. And you don't want yes men. You don't want to be, you, I, the last thing I want is a yes man around me. I want you to look at me and say, hey, man, what are you, out of your mind? Because at least you're being honest with me. Because I come up with some really wacky stuff sometimes. So I want I don't want yes, but I want people that are gonna be honest with me from the from the beginning. I'll moderate it, I'll manage it, and I won't allow people to get up on a side. What if you reach a stalemate on a certain issue? Right yeah, eventually the, the unified command spokesman has got to make that final decision. You admit this yeah. okay. uh, and you, you sink or swim on that decision. Okay. Uh, I think the yes. one of the things was the going out in the storm. Uh, I had a majority of a lot of people that didn't want to go out in the storm and then you still had that fire. Mentality that was going to go out there, and that was that was a problem. One of the other key problems there was the fire chief decided at some point he didn't want to go to the meetings. You know, and I realized that was one of the mistakes. Again, I told him about the mistakes I made. I have two fire coordinators that were supposed to be with me in the EOC, which would have made communications a lot easier. But because we had a very young and experienced fire chief, I allowed them to go out in the field with him to try and keep him from stepping on landmines, and I neglected my EOC, and that was a major problem. That was a major problem. Other questions? Sir? From the time the water came in town, how long did it stay before it got back and all you had was debris? I'm going to say about five hours. That was it. It came as fast as it came in. Once the, the storm pinned around, it came right back out again, which was absolutely amazing. I, I never expected that. Uh, we had very little standing water left, which was fortunate for us. Uh, the old bridge section, that area I showed you with John Street and those others that the uh, fire alert had 11 foot 9 inches. Two months before that, I had, there was a trench at the end of the road that leads down to the river. And over the years, that trench had gotten all thrown in with debris. And one of the old timers had told me about it. He said, when we were kids, we could keep it clear and the water would flow back out. So about two months before the store, I had the Corps of Engine, our um, conservation corps were down there and clean those trenches out. So when the water did come in, it went right back out for it. That was probably the best thing I ever did down there. Really helped them tremendously. Other questions? Thank you very much. I appreciate your time.